with us for the whole day and others our guests this evening you're very welcome as we gather around the word of the Lord uh, this evening we have some announcements before we commence uh, public worship uh, we have a card from the Arthur family who were with us a couple of weeks ago and uh, they used to attend this church for those that don't know and so they were with us for a few days and they say dear church family we're deeply grateful and impressed by your demonstration of warm Christian love and hospitality May the Lord richly bless you all and keep you delightfully serving him until we meet again in his will and by his grace. And that's signed James, Dalen, Isaac, Joel and Cadmiel, Arthur. And this will go up on the notice board uh, shortly. There's an announcement that the Lord's table, as you can see before you, is to be, is to be served this evening. And so uh, all those that are of the Lord, they are born again and they're walking aright with the Lord are welcome to feast at the table with and on Christ. Our next gospel outreach down in Picture Butte is on July 13th. It says 12 in the bulletin, but it's the 13th, Wednesday at 7.30. Do remember that in your prayers, please. Um, I, tr I hope to take uh, vac vacation this, this coming Lord's Day and the two following Lord's Days. That's July 10th, 17th and the 24th. Uh, the Reverend Fitton will fit in, remember him in your prayers, and the emergency contact is given here is Reverend Simpson. On Monday, July the 11th, there will be a session and a board meeting to be held, remember that in your prayers, and if you have anything for the agenda, please let me know. And uh, Caleb and uh, Catherine Duval are intending to move to Texas uh, for work, uh, but there are uh, challenges with the visas and the passports, so do Please remember them in your prayers. Remember also uh, Ryden and uh, Ashley as they make their many preparations. It's far more than you think. The many preparations that need to be done uh, for a wedding, uh, the wedding there, uh, August the 13th. Remember them and those that will be invited uh, to hear the gospel and to be uh, challenged and converted by the word of God. So that do remember those things that I've mentioned for prayer. I have an update for Chanson Schmidt. It says, Chanson had a pretty stable week. He's been moving more in the middle of the night. And one night he moved enough to almost kick off his blankets. He can reach his arms higher and now across his body. Praise God for progress. Please pray for Chanson's ankles to relax and have full mobility as we continue to contend for, contend for his full restoration. And that's a thank you from his parents. Uh, this coming Tuesday evening we have our Bible study and prayer meeting and the text is Ephesians 6 verse 16, saving faith an impenetrable shield uh, and that will be this uh, Tuesday at 7 p.m. and then next Lord's Day uh, morning at 11 a.m. morning worship and evening worship at 6 p.m. and that is taken as I've mentioned already by the Reverend Andrew Fitton and he will take the following uh, prayer meetings and uh, Lord's Day services in the subsequent uh, weeks until we return. All these announcements are subject to the will of Almighty God. Please take up your uh, songbooks to hymn 502. Hymn 502. Unto the hills around do I lift up my longing eyes. O oh, whence for me shall my salvation come? From whence arise? From God the Lord doth come my certain aid, from God the Lord who heaven and earth hath made. Stand to sing hymn 502, please.
Let us call upon the Lord in prayer. Let us pray, please. Merciful and eternal God, we give thee thanks and praise that thou hast once again brought us into thy house upon this Sabbath evening. We thank thee, Lord, for this day of, of feeding for the soul, a day of rest in Christ, a day of fellowship in the Lord. And today, Lord, we have again enjoyed the service of thee, thy worship, and even the time of baptism and this evening the Lord's table. And Lord, a rich day, these means of grace set before us, are displaying the mercy and the love and the kindness of God towards unworthy sinners. And thou art indeed a kind and merciful and we call upon thee in the name of thy Son, uh, giving thee humble thanks, but confessing also our great sin. Lord, thou art holy, and we are so unholy, those that have even been saved. And sanctification is at work in our lives, and yet so unholy in comparison with thee. Forgive thy people their sins. And we pray, Lord, that even tonight those who are not thy people, are not yet thy people, will hear the message of Christ, will have Christ set before them, will know the Spirit of Christ convicting their consciences of their own sin. And Lord, that they may be saved even tonight, or that the word of the gospel will be planted and done by Almighty God, and though they resist, they can do nothing, and their wills will be changed. And they will desire to call upon the name of the living God. O Lord, who can resist thee? Who can gainsay thee, O God? None. And we thank thee, Lord, for uh, this, uh, this service. We thank thee, Lord, that we may confess our sins and know in Christ that we have that fresh cleansing. And so we come before the merciful Lord tonight. As we are soon to sit at the table, uh, we pray, Lord, Will thou prepare the hearts of thy children, Lord, that we may have our eyes focused upon the Lord, be humbled before thee, that thou would raise us up. For indeed, thou must raise us up, not the flesh, but God. And Lord, that Christ will be exalted in every heart, Lord, and in the minds, in the thoughts, that God would be in our every thought. And will thou grant these, these gifts, will thou grant these graces, we pray, Lord, remember those that are elderly and infirm and sick who would normally be here this evening. May it please thee to give them that, that help, that healing touch, that comfort. Lord, even tonight, and as some may be able to join us online and others not. Oh Lord, without have mercy, remember also Caleb and Catherine and their need of our visas and a passport. Lord, would thou provide these things? We know, Lord, the great delays that there are in, in the bureaucracy that surrounds those two matters. But Lord, would thou be pleased to help, to give a way through and to give patience until it is thy time. And remember also, we pray, Chance and Schmidt. And Lord, we do humbly thank thee for having heard many prayers for that boy. O oh Lord, written off so early and so often by the medical uh, staff, Lord, and we praise Thee uh, that Thou hast heard our prayers thou hast, and many others' prayers. And so we do pray, raise him up to full health, O oh God. Remember also our brother, uh, Reverend Andrew Fitton, and the many meetings that he has before him. And Lord, and yet he still works also. And Lord, would Thou give him that, that help from above. Open Thy word. Lord, that he may see how thou and with what thou would feed thy children. And Lord, to give him strength, even with the many responsibilities. Uh, Lord, in the coming weeks, bless him uh, and, and bless him that he would be a blessing in the pulpit uh, to feed uh, the flock of God. 
Lord, remember this country, this land that is so against thee, against God and against his anointed. But we pray for mercy. We pray for revival and reformation. We pray for thee to send laborers into these harvest fields. O oh Lord, that many would hear the gospel. And Lord, not only hear the gospel, but we pray for a move of thy spirit, that many would re react, that many would obey the command of the gospel, that many would be saved. Oh Lord, thou canst do these things. Thou hast done it uh, throughout all time. In the biblical times of the Old and the New Testament, in the time of the New Testament church until now, in many places, Lord, the, uh, the reformation of the, of the 16th and the 17th century, Lord, that thou was able to save millions. Thou canst do it that there in, in that part of the world. And thou hast done it in smaller places here and there. Many saved in Marxist and, and, and communist and um, Muslim lands still even to this day. Thou indeed, Lord Jesus, art building thy church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against them. Continue to build. Pass not uh, Canada by, we pray. Lord, may we see uh, the gospel and the light of the gospel shining brightly in this land. I won't say once again, uh, Lord, but let it shine brightly in the future, in the near future, Lord. Meanwhile, keep us praying to this effect and answer, we pray, that Christ will be glorified. And it is our desire that even tonight, as the preaching goes forth and as we sit at the table, that Christ will be exalted in every heart. And maybe, Lord, for the first time, maybe tonight there will be a, a sinner outside of Christ that will come to faith by the powerful and irresistible electing work of God. Lord, save souls, we pray thee, and give glory to thy name. We pray thee in Jesus' name. Amen. Now please take up your songbooks to Psalm 110, Psalm 110 at the back of the songbooks, Psalm 110, Jehovah said unto my Lord, sit thou at my right hand, until I make thy foes a stool, whereon thy feet may stand. Singing Psalm 110, standing to sing please.
is now uh, the time for uh, the offering to the Lord's uh, work uh, to be given. But before we do that, we will um, change the order slightly and have our first Bible reading, or our main Bible reading, taken from the Gospel according to John. The Gospel according to John and chapter 17. And we'll read those verses uh, together now before we come back and have our offering and and sing once more. Chapter 17 of the Gospel according to John, commencing our reading at verse 1, and we will read the whole of the said chapter. John chapter 17. These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy Son, that thy Son also may glorify thee. As thou hast given him power over all flesh, uh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And this is life eternal that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou gavest them me, and they have kept thy word. Now they have known that all things whatsoever thou hast given me are of thee. For I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me, and they have received them, and have known surely that I came out from thee, and they have believed that thou didst send me. I pray for them. I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine, and all mine are thine, and thine are mine, and I am glorified in them. And now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to thee. Holy Father, keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. Those that thou gavest me I have kept, and none of them is lost, but the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. And now come I to thee, and these things I speak in the world, that they might have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them thy word, and the world hath hated them because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. And for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they also might be sanctified through the truth. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word, that they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me, and the glory which thou gavest me I have given them, that they may be one even as we are one, I in them and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. Father, I will that they also, whom thou hast given me, be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, 
which thou hast given me, for thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, the world hath not known thee, but I have known thee, and these have known that thou hast sent me, and I have declared unto them thy name, and will declare it, that the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them, and I in them. Amen. May the Lord bless his word to our every heart. It's now time for the offering uh, to be taken. Uh, and ask our brother deconstruct to come and give a short word of thanksgiving. And immediately after the collection has been taken, we'll sing from him 232. Thank you.
turn with me once again to John chapter 17. And we will read together the, <clears throat> the verses for the preaching of God's Word this evening. And they are John 17, uh, verses 20 to 23. John chapter 17 and verse 20 up to and including verse 23. So reading from verse 20. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word, that they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me, and the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them, that they may be one even as we are one. I in them and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me, and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. Amen. Let us briefly pray for help at this time. Our Lord and God, we give Thee thanks for Thy Word. We thank Thee, Lord, that we may hear the Word of God, the highest Word, the most glorious Word, the truest Word, a holy Word, a holy Word that converts the sinner dead in sin, a holy word that sanctifies the saint. O oh Lord, what a precious word of truth are these scriptures of truth. We thank thee, Lord, that we've had the privileges of hearing and even reading them. And we pray now, Lord, that thou would come with thy spirit as thy word is preached, that thou would open ears and soften necks and take the sword of the Spirit and open the hearts of everyone to have mercy, to do those spiritual miracles in the hearts of man. Lord, even tonight, we do pray that thy word may be a converting word, that the power of the Spirit of God may convict Lord, that thy children may even know that convicting work and know the grace being added unto grace and the growing in the likeness of Christ thy Son. Lord, thou help us this evening uh, to feed on the word, to prepare us as we feed on the word at the table and give unto me all that I need from heaven, the unction, the grace, and the power, Lord, that thy word would go forth in manifestation of the power of the Spirit to the glory of God. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. In our monthly meditations at the Lord's Table, we hold the Lord's Table every month, uh, we often hold in remembrance the bitter sufferings and death of the Lord Jesus, often do so. But what we should also hold in remembrance are the sweet fruits that come forth from the bitter sufferings and death of the Lord. And after the Lord had changed the Passover meal into the Lord's table, into the Last Supper, and after Judas ha had left the gathering and had gone to betray his master, the Lord then continues to speak uh, and teach and give words of comfort and words of challenge to the disciples and any others that were in the room at the time. And we see that there in chapters 14 and then 15 and 16 of John. But as we come to chapter 17, the Lord uh, changes his focus 
so much instead of focusing on the disciples and their many needs, our many needs. He turns his attention to his heavenly Father and prays that a wonderful prayer that we've read this evening uh, that we call the high priestly prayer. That Christ as the high priest of God's people interceding on our behalf, uh, praying for all our needs, is now shown praying and doing that prayer, praying that prayer. And there's much to be said about this prayer. The Puritan Thomas Manton uh, wrote a whole book or preached a whole sermons that were a series of sermons that were all collected in one book. But we won't go into the many, many details. There are at least 26 sermons here, one for each verse, and many, maybe, ser- verses that need more than one. But it is toward the end of this prayer that the text for the preaching for this evening comes from verses 20 to 23, as we've read. And these verses teach us some very comforting truths, some, some comforting, some challenging, and, and some noteworthy truths. And as the Lord is pleased to help us this evening, let us learn then something of Christ and the Father's love. Christ and the Father's love. And we'll see how we get that title as we we enter in and, and look at these points that we have this evening. And we see firstly from verse 20 that Christ prays for me. That Christ prays for me. Christ prays for all of his people. You can say that if you are a born-again believer. You can say, well, as we read verse 20, Christ is praying for me. Let us read verse 20. Neither pray, neither pray I for these alone. He's not just praying for the disciples. But for them also which shall believe on me through their word. Through the great commission that goes out and and that in immediate onus, that burden is laid upon the shoulders of the apostles. And as the apostles go out and preach in, in, in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and the four corners, taking it to the four corners of the earth. And then they appoint uh, evangelists and, and co-missionaries and, and, and preachers. They continue to go out, and, and, and that's what we have. As we read here, they shall believe on me through their word. We, we have never met a true life apostle, a real apostle, plenty of fake apostles, but a, a real apostle we never met, but we have the teaching of the apostles. And it's come through, it's been passed down, it's preached, been preached from this person to that person to that person. So that's the true apostolic succession, by the way, is the apostolic teaching from the scriptures that comes through even to us this day. And we discover this, that Christ prays for us, not only for those 11 that were in the room, but prays for all those that will yet hear the word, that will be affected by the word, that will believe the word that has been sent to them. Now we understand that this whole prayer is an example of how the Lord prays for all his people even now. It's an example. There are so many petitions in here that we can understand and and look at, and I I would like to, in the Lord's will, at some time in the future, do so. But this is how the Lord prays for his people, for having then entered into his great sufferings and having been crucified and died and been uh, buried and having risen from the grave on the third day and having spent 40 days with his disciples having spent 40 days or times during those 40 days, uh, having meetings and appearing only to his disciples, because indeed, as he says, that he is no longer in the world. So, but of course, he's, he's on earth. That's not what he means. He's no longer giving a public ministry in the world to all that would hear him. This is his last meeting with his own, with his disciples. And even Judas has gone. The son of perdition has left. It's just those that are his that the Father has given to him. And he is teaching them. Even as he's now praying to the Father, and as it were, has, has foc- refocused his gaze upon the Lord, they're still being taught. And we are still being taught. And, and he is praying. And he is praying on their behalf. 
He prays for the glory of the Father. He prays that the Father would glorify him, and he must be glorified that we would know the resurrection and future glorification, that we would have a home in heaven because Christ has been glorified all the way up there, and we are to be with him where he is, the petition in verse 24. And so all these petitions are ultimately for the good of the people of God for all those that would know the Lord, for all those, as it says here, which shall believe on me through their word. And so we now ha we understood that Christ did ascend into heaven after those 40 days, that he sits at the right hand of the majesty on high, that he sits on the throne of God because he is God. That Jesus Christ is God, he is the God-man sitting on the throne of his Father who is God. And Hebrews 7 and verse 25, and we've preached from this verse, uh, I believe, last year. And it is that verse that reveals to us Christ's very important task that he can, carries on now, even now this second, for his people. Hebrews 7 and verse 25 says, Wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him. And it's speaking of other matters, but it's this part of the verse that we want to understand. Seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. Christ's exalted life and glory, enthroned on the throne of God, surrounded by worshiping angels and saints, and he's sitting there on a place that's called the mercy seat, the throne of God, the throne of grace. And this merciful Savior from that seat dispenses mercy and grace to all that would come unto him, to all his people. He lives for his people. He died for his people, but now he lives again, and it's still that he lives for his people. He lives to pray on behalf of all his people, and he loves us, and he gave himself for us, and therefore he loves to pray for us. Now, we might find that difficult. We might find often prayer, not always, but sometimes, or maybe more often than we would admit, prayer a, a dry and difficult duty, but that's not the way the Lord Jesus Christ sees it. He loves to pray. For his, he loves to pray to his Father, whom he loves. And his father loves to hear the voice of Christ, whom he loves. But because he loves us, with an undying love, he loves to pray to the Father for us, for the people of God, for his own. And that phrase from Hebrews 7 and verse 25, he ever liveth to make intercession for them, well, it speaks of Christ's role as intercessor. As him, as he that prays for others, he intercedes for them. And as an intercessor, he's also an advocate. He, he speaks for them, he pleads for them. An intercessor and an, and an advocate. And if you don't know what an advocate is, it, it's a type of lawyer that speaks on your behalf in court. He speaks on their behalf and he prays for them. And although we sin and fail every day, Christ ever speaks a word in our favor towards the Father. Now they pray for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. For the millions and millions that by grace have been saved from their sin and to be brought into the fold of Christ, he prays for them. How can one man pray for so many so intensely, day and night, 24 hours a day? Well, this is the divinity of Christ, that he is the God-man, that as a man he has that compassion towards us, he has, he has received that frame yet without sin, but a true human body and a reasoning soul, but he is divine. And it is that incredible divinity of Christ Although he be man and though he be finite in so many ways in the form of man, and yet within that, 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 that finite form of man there is an infinite God, eternal God, that drives the God-man, that, that gives the power to the God-man to, can I say this, know you 
and be with you 100% of the time, with, as it were, 100% of who he is. I will never leave you nor forsake you. How can he do that if he has so many whom he loves and whom he intercedes for, for whom he prays? Well, this is it, the divinity, the infinite and eternal God in man can give you that 100% focus, will hear every petition, every prayer that half falls out of a wounded heart, he will hear and he will know and he will see and he is with you. The everlasting arms of Christ are underneath and they are carrying you. He is 100% focused on you and 100% focused on you and 100% focused on you. He ever liveth uh, to make intercession and although our prayers are weak and our prayers are inconsistent, he prays. He prays with us by his Spirit, whom he has filled us with. He prays with us and he prays for us that our prayers be found acceptable in the Lord's sight. And although it is this case that in the eternal glory, after the resurrection, after the renewal of all things, after the judgment day, that we will be perfectly holy, where we body and soul will both be holy and united and be glorifying Christ and, and glorifying the Lord, worshipping Him, and we will be in His very presence, the presence of Christ Himself filled with that atoning blood, He will still ever pray for us. Though we never utter a word of prayer that we can hear, the atoning blood speaks for us. Christ, our Passover lamb, in the glory with us, filled with that blood that atoned for our sins. And so without a word, that, that, that blood speaks of peace and it speaks of reconciliation and it speaks of holiness and it speaks of acceptance with God without the Lord opening his mouth to utter a word of intercession. And so Paul writes to the Hebrew Christians in verse 24 of Hebrews 12, and it says this, And to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, the word mediator even brims with the idea of being an intercessor. He's the mediator of the new covenant and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. The speaking blood of Jesus, ever with us in the glory ever with us in the presence of God. What a precious blood is the blood of Jesus. The blood prays for us. The Savior prays for us. The Spirit within of Christ utters prayers without word. And that self-same praise that we've seen from Hebrews 7 and 25, he ever liveth to make intercession for them. It's not just speaking about that non-stop interceding for his people, but it points to this also. It is his great eternal motivation for his people. That's, that's what he lives to do. This is what he lives eternally to do, to pray for you and me. Thank God that we have the Lord Jesus Christ praying for us. We're ever encouraged when, when we know of Christians who say, brother, I've been praying for you, or, or this, we've been praying for you, and you know that in difficult times, they've, you've just known there's, there's, a, there's a strength that you wouldn't normally have when the Lord carrying you through difficult times, grieving times, whatever they might be. And so we're encouraged when we know of the prayers of the saints for us, and, 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 and that is important. We are to pray for all saints in all times, in all places, but to know this, that the Redeemer of every saint is non-stop praying. What a failure and what a catastrophe our Christian lives would be. What, what, what a failure would the church be if Christ wasn't constantly praying and he desires to pray. He lives to pray. He lives to pray for you and for me. He lives to do it. He delights to do it. And because we know that Jesus is praying for us, can we not learn to uh, and be encouraged to rest in him? He's on the ball. He's got the petitions ready before they've sprung into your head. He's already praying. And then we sort of come in at the last minute with, with, a, with a feeble and badly worded prayer, which is heard in heaven because of him. 
but he has been praying all this time. Remember how often the Lord says, Peter, I have been praying for thee. He's already been praying. Thank God that he supports us in our manifold weaknesses. He lives to do it because he loves his people. The love drives him to pray. And so let us be encouraged, therefore, to pray. Here, there he is, on the other end, as it were, desiring to hear our petitions, uh, to fill them with power, to fill them with holiness, to say, Father, he's praying again, she's praying again. And I pray along with her, and I pray along with him. Christ prays for me. And secondly, as we move into verse 21, we see Christ's petitions for unity. Christ petitions for unity. Verse 21 says that they all may be one as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee. That they also may be one in us that the Father, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. And although we look at this passage and we, we see only the mention of the Father and the Son, the Son praying to the Father and, and Christ in his word speaking of Son and Father all the time, let me say this, that the Spirit is very much present. The Spirit is, is, is very present. For Christ, as, he, as he's speaking these words, and he's, he's speaking in and through the Spirit. It's through the Spirit. As John 3 and verse 34 tells us, these are 15 chapters earlier, it speaks of Christ, for he whom God hath sent speaketh the words of God. Now we've taught that Christ has been teaching that already, that these are the Father's words. And then it continues, for God giveth not the Spirit by measure unto him. But that, what that word means is it's not being given in, in, a, in a limited amount. The Spirit of God is in an unlimited amount filling the God-man, empowering him, strengthening him. And indeed, these, these verses are revealed to us and they are applied to us by the Holy Spirit, by the Spirit of God. And we understand from the Scriptures that the eternal Son is eternally begotten of the Father. That's an eternal truth. This is my only begotten Son. He is, he, he is being constantly begotten by the Father spiritually. That is a truth. We also know this, that the Holy Ghost is both the Spirit of God, that is of the Father, and the Spirit of Christ. It's the one and the same Spirit. There is only one, one Spirit. The fullness of the Spirit. And some theologians might say, without taking anything away from the divine third person of the Trinity, uh, that the Holy Ghost is the love itself that binds the Father with the Son. But we are stepping into deep, eternal waters, and we will just pull back from that. But we understand that there is a great love, that God is love. It doesn't say in the Scriptures, God loves to describe him, it is true he is loving, but God is love. He is love itself. And Christ here petitions the Father that all believers would know the same unity with each other as he has with the Father, that they, may, that they all may be one. And what is this unity that the Father has with the Son? Because now he's talking about creatures having a unity that is found within the triune Godhead. Now that unity that, that, that exists between the Father and the Son, well, we know that it is a perfect unity of love, it is a perfect unity of purpose, and it is a perfect unity of message. Those are three things that we've heard in John chapter 17. And where does that exist among the people of God? Or where has it ever existed? 
that there is that unity. It certainly does not point to a, hu a union of human organization when he speaks of the unity of believers in this way. Unity in Christ exists in spite of differences in denominations. There are at least three or four denominations represented here. And there is a union in Christ, not in human organization. It's also not a union of, 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 of confessing Christians that will, that will, that will do anything to create a, 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 a united human organization. They'll abandon doctrine, they'll abandon truth, and they'll do anything just to make a bigger organization and say how, how united we are. In, in what? Not a unity of the truth. True doctrine, I believe I mentioned this very recently, a true, doc true doctrine divides falsehood from truth. It makes a clear division. When we have the true teaching from the scriptures on any point, then we know, well, this is true, and therefore that is untrue. And that true doctrine is what, what we call false ecumenism hates. And ecumenism is a at least false ecumenism is where, where, where churches and, and, and congregations, they'll, they'll join together and they will give up absolutely anything just to have that union that I've already mentioned. Yeah, true doctrine divides. But what is also true, that true doctrine unites. It unites those that know and love the truth in spite of denomination, in spite of congregation. That is true also that many Christians come to faith but know little of divine truth. And they may go on to attend churches where little truth is taught. Uh, but this would mean that a new Christian that attends an Arminian church would not have a unity with a mature Reformed Christian if, uh, if it was a union that he's speaking of is a union of church or denomination or congregation. So unity in doctrine, although it is an important goal and it is the basis of the Westminster standards, and three forms of unity, it's not the unity Christ is speaking of. And although it's certainly connected to the unity, it is not the unity. What is that unity that the Son has with the Father? It is the union made by the Holy Ghost. That is the union that the Son has with the Father. When the Son is on earth and the Father has filled him without measure with his Spirit. And as I've already said, the Spirit of the Father is the Spirit of the Son. And therefore let us understand this, that this true spiritual unity that Christ is, is not speaking of, but praying about, that all believers have is the unity in and with the Holy Spirit of God. That's why you can, that's why you can meet somebody who professes Christ and, and you can shake their hands and there's a, there is that connection that you have with them, both filled with the Spirit of Christ. Now their understanding of doctrine might be different than yours and they may be completely wrong, but they're saved in spite of their doctrine. And you're saved in spite of yours or lack of it. And so when we consider then that the, it is the Spirit of God that indwells every true believer, then we understand it's the reason why the Spirit is in there, because the Spirit is doing important things. We, we've considered it this morning and touched upon it this afternoon, is, is the need of the rebirth, and that's what the Spirit does. So the, the Spirit of Christ is, is entering into all His people and doing the same work. There's the union in the Gospel the union and, and bringing them into the body of Christ, the union in the body. And that's what we have, that unity, regeneration, we can call it sanctification, at work, at work in the, in the soul of the sinner. And as, we, and as that work is continued, where, do, where else do we see that unity? Well, we see that unity is expressed on the outside by what's being done on the inside. 
as we consider what sanctification is, it is a dying more and more unto sin and a living more and more unto righteousness, to quote the Shorter Catechism. And it is that which unites us to Christ, or, or it reveals our union with Christ, all having that union with Christ, all the many believers having the union with Christ through the faith, we mentioned this today already, the faith that has been worked within us, and all being united individually and personally to Christ by the Spirit of Christ that works that faith in us to Christ, that they all may be one, one body, one people, one kingdom, one flock. That they all may be one as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee. That they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. So all of being united to Christ, and we see that, that, that petition, as all of his petitions are fully answered. All believers will be united to each other. They will be united to each other as the Father is united to the Son by the permanent indwelling of his Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit that is given to the believer at conversion is never removed from him. That's, or her, that spirit that is given is called, is called in different words, is called as a down payment, as a deposit given, a deposit to glory, a deposit to, to, to how it will yet be in, in future life. We know that uh, from Ephesians where it talks about the spirit. And it says, in whom ye also trusted after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed ye were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. But you not received the promise. In part, in part the promise has been received. But the full promise will be this of eternal life. Here we go, and, he's, and then following on, uh, this is uh, Ephesians chapter 1, verses 13, now verse 14, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. What is he trying to say? That, well, the soul is converted. The soul receives the Holy Spirit you're sealed with the Holy Spirit and is the Holy Spirit of promise because what has happened to your soul will yet happen to your body. That your soul is, is in union with Jesus Christ who sits in heaven. One day the, ho the body and soul will be in heaven. And heaven will be on earth. And he is the earnest. That's the word that's used here, the earnest. It's an, it's a, it's a, it's an, older, an older word for a hefty deposit. A hefty sum of money that's given with the promise and the hope that, that, that the full sum will be paid. You'd like to buy that, that SUV. Well, here, let me put 500 down and I'll come back in two weeks' time with the rest. But an earnest is a hefty sum and hefty payment the Spirit of God himself given to the sinner. And if he's done that to your soul, he'll do that for your body. And he won't just do it for one day, but the eternal Spirit will do it for eternity, uniting you to God, uniting you to the Son of God. Now, this wonderful spiritual truth that the reunion, the union that we have is through the Spirit of Christ, the Spirit of God, doesn't deny the fact that the Lord does indeed desire his people to have unity, to be united together. He desires it greatly. Of course, that true unity must be based upon truth, but that's what the Lord desires. And it is the evidence then when we see unity within a congregation or between congregations or within a denomination or in a presbytery, that it's evidence of the work of God's Spirit. I take you to Psalm 133. Psalm 133 says, Behold how good and pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious ointment upon the head that ran down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard, that went down to the skirts of his garments. 
as the dew of Hermon and as the dew that descended upon the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord commanded the blessing, even life forevermore. It, it's good and pleasant for brethren to dwell in unity, to have gracious unity together. And, and it, it, it speaks there in using the language of the Holy Ghost, of, of a precious ointment, of the anointing of the priest. And, and we have the priesthood of believers. So it's not just talking about Aaron. It's not just talking about the Old Testament. Priesthood is not just speaking of Christ as the, as the high priest of the order of Melchizedek, as we sang in Psalm 110. But it also truly speaks of all believers receiving the Spirit of God, but that the Spirit of God would make that that, 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 that unity, that the brethren would dwell together in unity, for there the Lord commanded the blessing, even life forevermore. So what unity that we have here, and it is a, it is a broken unity, it is, a, it is an inconsistent unity, but what unity there is here is a, is a foretaste of the absolute complete unity that there will be in the glory. But the unity comes from the Lord. But when we seek it from the Lord, let us receive it from the Lord. And so let us endeavor by the power of the Spirit to obtain that unity, to maintain that unity. Because the flesh doesn't want the unity. The flesh wants the glory. But Christ must have all the glory. Christ prays for me. And Christ petitions for unity also for me. And thirdly, Christ's glory from the Father that he prays about in verse 22. Christ's glory from the Father. And he says in verse 22, And the glory which thou gavest me I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one. And the question, what is that glory? There are hints at it through the earlier verses in John 17. If you were to read various uh, commentators, even going back to uh, John Chrysostom, uh, he certain ideas that the glory that was given to the disciples, well, that was the glory of the miracles, that was the glory of the power, the, the signs of the apostles. But remember, he's not just praying about the apostles. He's not just praying concerning the apostles. He, he's praying for all those who yet shall believe on me. And we are not apostles. We do not have the signs of the apostles. Now, what it would appear to be, and I believe it was Calvin that said this, is concerning the restoration of the image of God in man. That's the glory. It may not be the only glory, but it is a glory that, it, that, that, that Calvin uh, pointed to. Because we understand this, and this has also been recently mentioned, is that the image of God was marred and spoiled in the fall, and here we are so marred and so spoiled still in, in sinfulness. Although we be born again, if we be born again, th there is great disfiguring of the image of God in us. God is, God is not mean. God is not spiteful. Uh, God is not the many things that we are. And when we are those things, we're showing that the image of God is marred in us, disfigured and twisted. And yet the whole point of, of, of not the whole point, but a, an important theme within the gospel is that once the rebirth has taken place, there is to be a great change to take place. It's not just the same person with the same old sins and sinful behaviors, you know, then goes to church. And that's it. There is to be a radical, that means of the root. The root of sin has been dealt with and therefore there should be an absolutely new life. And that's what the Lord desires is, is a restoration of the image of God and the restoration of the image of God that we can understand in terms of the gospel is the image of Christ. The image of Christ to be this Christ-likeness, be becoming more like Christ, being as patient and compassionate and meek and humble and God-honoring as Christ, as, as prayerful as Christ. 
because Christ came in the flesh of sinful man to deal with our sin. And in, in his first epistle, John wrote in chapter 3 and verse 5, and he says, and you know that he was manifested to take away our sin. He was manifested, he was revealed, he was incarnated in our flesh to take away our sin, as, and in him is no sin. So he came in that form that we have, and yet it was a sinless form. It was a holy form. He is the new Adam, where Adam failed and fell, that this new Adam, again, it's amazing how much of this is sort of uh, coming full circle from this morning and from this afternoon. But he is the image that we should be, being our covenant head, being we being his children should desire to walk in the image of him as our father. So in Christ, the image of God was fully restored. And it is God's desire that that would continue through. That it would continue through. It doesn't because we're so carnal. But this is God's will. It's God's desire. And it wouldn't just remain in that little part of your soul that God converted. He wants to see it working its way through to the whole soul, to the whole inner man, and to the whole outer man that has completely been subdued, mortified uh, by the soul that is born again. That's far too much work for some people. But let me tell you, it's God's desire for you and for me. And this is really what we could call the glorification of the saint while he's still on earth. The true glorification, of course, is, is the souls in heaven and, 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 and thereafter at the judgment and the resurrection uh, that the bodies would be uh, also holy and fully glorified body and soul. That's true. But I'm talking that sanctification and its work in the believer is to be a, a foretaste of glorification. There should be a little bit of glorification on earth. And what glory it would be to shine with the holy glory of Christ. And what a glory it is to be able to do that. And what a terrible truth that many do shine but dimly. And yet morally and spiritually the image of Christ is being restored in the life of every true believer. But those that work against it, those that gain sane and, and, and work against the spirit, it might only be this much until glory suddenly fulfills the rest. But it is the Lord's desire that it would be much more than that, that the world may see, that the world may have that witness, that that person used to be catty, they used to be spiteful, they used to be a gossip, but see the difference that the gospel has made? They used to complain and be vindictive, and they used to do this and do that, but see how the change has gone. What is this gospel? Who is this Jesus? So often, give me a little bit of Jesus and so much of the flesh. But let the flesh, but I would, the Bible says, and let me speak as the Bible says, that the flesh be mortified and Christ be glorified. Would that God would give us the grace to do that? Would that God would give us that grace? Christ prays for me, Christ petitions for unity, Christ's glory from the Father that he gives to us, and fourthly and finally, Christ's Father's love. Christ's Father's love. And verse 23 then, I in them and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one. And that the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. There are themes that the Lord is repeating. He's repeating again and again throughout the whole of this prayer. And so some of those we've already looked at, that, that, that the unity, the desire for the unity, and through that unity there would be a great and, an, and, and, and a witness that none could gainsay, none could contradict. None could speak against. 
And there are two wonderful aspects of divine love that are opened up to us in this verse. And first of all, this electing love. Electing love. I in them and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one. What is that? That making perfect. Uh, the word perfect, we, we, we often misunderstand what perfect means. Uh, perfect, in its original sense, is the idea of the completion of something. Something has been perfected. Something has been completed. Uh, and this is what he is praying about here. The making perfect is the completion of all the elect into one people. That they, all of those that would yet believe, may be made perfect in one that there would be one people, that there would be one flock that are all Christ-like, that are all filled to the brim with Christ's Spirit. They, they are filled with the Father's adopting Spirit. This really does look forward to that time when all the lost sheep have been gathered in. They've been gathered in, they've been saved, all of them, and not one lost. They've all been sanctified. They're all glorified, body and soul. It's, it's really a looking ahead to glory. And this will happen. Every one of Christ's people will be part of this people. It will happen because Christ prays it. And every petition of the Lord is answered. And Christ prays also according to God's will, therefore, Every petition is answered. It's a great encouragement, I think, here given to the poor saint, the poor believer struggling and failing, struggling in, in, against the tests and the trials of life, great tests, great trials, great failures. And although you may be painfully aware, and I trust you are painfully aware of your own weaknesses and may be aware of the weaknesses of your fellow brethren and sisters in the Lord, here we have this. One day, all weakness will be removed. All, all weakness, all sinfulness, all failing will be removed. Each will be complete. We will be complete in the Lord. We will be perfected by God. And we will be united together with the triune Jehovah. So having taken, taken a mass of, of spiritually dead, corrupt sons of Adam, and the Lord is taking them, and, and one by one through time and through history, through the work of His Spirit, through the, through the power of the word of the preaching, and, and bringing them through their own new life in Christ, in, in the many varied uh, failings and tests. But, but believe and know this, that there is coming a time when all of that will be far, far behind a distant memory, if we would even think of it. But we will, because it will cause us to praise the Lord Jesus Christ with all of our songful throats for all eternity, for what we were, but what we are, absolutely perfect in Christ. Again, with the individualities that the Lord has, the individual personalities and characters that the Lord has given us, but all Christ-like, all perfect, all honest, all holy, body and soul. And it will be perfect in that, that sense of the word. It will be complete and it will be glorious. Christ came to redeem his people and he will have a redeemed people. The redeemed of the Lord shall rejoice on Zion forever and ever. That is yet to come. He saved you from this. You're in the valley, you're on the mountaintop, you're in the, fail, the failings of, of a Christian walk, but this is yet to come, and it will come because Christ has prayed it. That they may be made perfect in one. And while he's making us perfect, that the world may know that thou hast sent me. So uh, electing love, those who are elect from all eternity, plucked out of the hands of sin and Satan, brought through the life of sanctification, however long or short it might be, and here they are. Because the power of electing love. But secondly, we have adopting love. And we close with this. 
adopting love. And he says, And that the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. This brings us more into this time again, where, we're now, where we are now. Not yet that glorious future, but, but where we are, are at the moment. There is a time that will yet come when the unbelieving world will not be able to deny the power and the person of Christ. So whether this does point to a worldwide reformation that is yet to happen, and I pray that it will, or to the end of all things is up to debate, but it is described also by the Apostle Paul in Romans. He says this, for it is written, Romans 14 and verse 11, for it is written, as I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. You say, yeah, but is, is, is that not the day of judgment? Maybe. But maybe it's for the day, before the day of judgment. But what is very strongly revealed and fully revealed in the latter part of this verse and is actually the reason for the whole sermon is the love of the father to his adopted children. The love of the father to his adopted children, the adopting love of the father. It says he, and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. The eternal and infinite Father of our Lord Jesus Christ reveals in a number of places in the New Testament how great his joy and delight in the Lord Jesus is. And he declares it. He loves him. He delights in him. One example, Matthew 3, verse 17. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And we go into the Old Testament, and there are many places where we understand something of the joy that the Father had from all eternity, with the, uh, the, the joy that the Father had with the Son, and, and of course, vice versa. The Father's Son is beloved. He's loved. He is well and deeply loved. He's eternally loved by the Father. And he's greatly pleasing to the Father. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. The Father has a deep love, an eternal love towards the Son, towards Christ. And all the Son always pleases the Father. Do you know the word that's used here is an unconditional love? Now, when you consider Jesus Christ and how perfect and how glorious and how obedient he is, uh, then you might expect that it would be that word that talks about a conditional love, that the Father loves Jesus Christ because he's done this and this and this and this and this and a million other things, and he has done them so well. And we can understand that because humans work with conditional love too much, but that's a very natural thing that we have. You know, you like me, I like you. You like watching... F- Football, I like watching football. Let's be friends. And, some, and that's, to be honest, that's, that's the basis of most male friendships. But let's move on from that. But we have this uh, conditional love. And, 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 you know, if you're not nice to me, then I'm not going to be nice to you. That's a very natural thing. You say someone says something mean to you, you say something mean back to them. Of course, that's not, that's not conditional love. But that just shows that the, that the affection and the friendship is all conditioned upon what they do. But the Lord doesn't want that from us. But what I'm trying to say is, he, although we could expect that it could be conditional love because Christ fulfills all the conditions, and yet the love to, from the Father to the Son is described here as unconditional love, without any condition, an absolute free, un, uh, without condition love that the Father has towards the Son. That is, there is no conditions and there are no limitations. And the love is given. It's just poured out, and it will never stop. It will never cease. There's nothing that can damn it. There's nothing that can hinder it because it is unconditional. It's without limits, and it's flowing forth. A rich, warm, pleasing, joyful love going forth without ceasing ever, boundlessly, we can use that word as well, towards the Lord Jesus Christ. But for those who by faith are saved by this Christ... Christ's Father has become our Father. Christ's Father has become our Father. That's what the Lord Jesus Christ teaches us. 
teach us to pray. He says, Our Father. But the Father of Christ has now by adoption become our Father. And we become the Father's children. Because the Father gladly adopts us for Christ's sake. So he has, by his work of salvation, not made an army of slaves to fulfill his every whim. He has made a people, but more so, he has made a family. He calls us brethren, because yes, we are his servants. Yes, we are his saves, slaves. We are, we are many aspects. We are, many, we are his children. We are so many things to Christ. We are the redeemed people of the Lord, but we are also his brethren. And we're not considered second-class children. Quite often it can be in a family where they have an adopted child. You know, the real blood children, you know, th th they get all the benefits and the adopted one, well, shut up, you know, you should be glad that you've got a parent now. And they're second rate. Fortunately, not, not in every family, but it happens. Or in the case where there's a, uh, where, where, where there's a breakdown in marriage, or to say the, the, the father dies and then the mother marries another man, and then they have children, their children are more important than the, older, than the other children. There's a difference. There's a favoritism. But not in God. Not in God. We're not considered second-class children. We become the objects of the same love that Christ receives. We become the objects of the same love that Christ unceasingly receives. And hast loved them as thou hast loved me. A never ceasing, boundless, rich, and warm love the Father has to Christ is the same warm and rich love that flows boundlessly to his children, to the redeemed of the Lord. And because it's unconditional, it is not based upon what you do and what you don't do. It's not based upon your failings. It doesn't, it's not based on how hardworking you are for the Lord. The Father's rich and full and warm love is unconditionally yours. Because that is how the Heavenly Father loves all of His children. He doesn't hold it back. He doesn't cool it down. He doesn't turn down the tap. He doesn't look disapprovingly and frowning like earthly fathers do. He loves. And though there may be times that there will be that chastisement of the Lord, because we really have gone out of our way to allow the flesh to rule us, there will be a chastisement. It's to bring us back under the fountain of God's unceasing love. We have wandered, and yet he brings us back to the unconditional love of God. It, it is a glorious and a wonderful truth. It is a wonderful and humbling reality. And therefore, there is nothing that a child of God can do to lose this love. Nothing. There's nothing that we can do to cool the love. It shines forth upon us constantly. And the only problem here is ourselves. We do not bask in this love often enough or long enough. But the opportunity to experience this precious love of God that is only found in Jesus Christ is always there. He will never withdraw that love and we must just come underneath it and seek him. And I'm not talking about some, some strange charismatic feeling, but I'm talking that time of, of, of heartfelt meditation upon the truths of God as, as he's revealed of himself and as he revealed of Christ in the gospel to you, that it warms, that you know something of that warm love of the Father toward you, a good Father, a giving father, a father that delights. John Owen in his work on the communion of God, when he speaks, he speaks of it's important to have communion with God, but he also says uh, the scriptures reveal also different aspects of the communion, the, the fellowship that we can have with the father separately from the son and even from the spirit. 
And, and, in, and in speaking of, of, that, of, that, of that meditation, devotion, and love and worship towards the Father, he says that we, we should learn to, uh, all scripturally, of course, is understand who the Father is, that he is, he is the Father of lights, that every good gift that I have ever had, every perfect gift that has ever been given to me, and we start number one on the list is the Lord Jesus Christ, of course, but everything else, the, the spiritual and the, and the physical gifts that the Lord has given him, all come from this kind, loving, giving Father who loves us with an unconditional love, whose heart brims eternally and infinitely with love for you. James in chapter 4 and verse 8 says this. It says, draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. How can that be in the same sentence? How can that be in the same verse? Because it is. It's the cleansing of hands. It's the cleansing of sinful deeds. Purifying the heart. Stop being double-minded. Stop doubting God. Maybe stop being a liar and draw an eye to God. Come, as it were, under the fountain of God's love and he will draw nigh unto you. And hast loved them as thou hast loved me. The love of God, the Father to the Son, is the love of the Father to all his children. If you do not have Christ, let me say this, if you do not have Christ, you do not have the love of the Father. You do not. You may know something of God's providential kindness. You may know that God causes the rain to fall on the just and the unjust, that is the believer and the unbeliever. You may see, well, I'm blessed, my family's blessed, and yeah, God is very kind in his providence to all. He is kind, that is his nature. But God's eternal and warm love is exclusively to those that he finds in Christ. It's a love that he only gives to his children. Fathers, you know that. There's a love that you have to your children that you do not give to others. There's an embrace that you give, well, let's say mothers as well. There is an embrace, there is a love, there is a tenderness that you have to your own children, as nice as you are to other people, but you would not give that tenderness to others. It's not willy-nilly. It's exclusively to those that Father finds in Christ. And if you would have the love of God, then you must come to Christ. If you have the love of God instead of the righteous hatred of God and wrath against you, then you must come to Christ to have both of those dealt with. And to have faith in Christ, you must repent of your sin and you must call upon the Lord. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. May God bless his word to us all this evening. Amen. Let us close this portion of our meeting in prayer before we come to the Lord's table. Lord, we do thank thee for thy word, what we've learned, what we've read. Most especially, O oh Lord, as my desire as preacher, that the truth of the love of God towards thy love, Father, to thy Son has become the, thy, thy love toward us. How glorious thou art and how merciful thou art. Impress this truth upon us that we might be revived in the love of God who loves us with an undying love and it's not based upon us. It flows forth to all his children. And those, Lord, who are still outside of Christ, we pray. We pray for gospel mercies to rain down this evening. Lord, would thou have mercy and bring others under thy eternal and infinite love in Jesus. For we pray in his name. Amen.